Now I'd like to bring up Susan Cartsonis. So Susan, as I said, um, as a producer in the US made What Women Want and as a young executive supervised Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's a member of the Academy of the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, chair of the Women in Films Foundation Board, uh, a member of the Producers Guild of America and recently spoke at the Women's Summit at the Directors Guild of America. She's joining us, as I said, from LA where it is late afternoon. Hello, Susan Katsonis, how are you? Hello, nice to join you. <laughs> So, Susan, I know that many of these issues are very dear to you, and I don't know why Susan's popped back, but anyway, she, we can see on the little screen, and we'll, our team will get her back up on the main screen. There she is. <coughs> so, Helen mentioned the really relevant hot topic of likability. Now, a protagonist, as we all know, needs an arc, and therefore they need to be flawed at the beginning of the story. But often, and I know I've been involved in many development conversations, where someone gets anxious about the likability of a flawed female protagonist in the first act. And that can often end up in them being really flattened. Have you seen this? And what, if, if it happens to any of us, what can we do about it? Um, well, recently I was working with a female action writer who I'm mentoring. And I read a script that she wrote. And it's a very well-written action script in terms of the action. And the male character has a, has a great dilemma but the female character is kind of along for the ride. And she was wondering why she wasn't getting any traction with the script. And I said to her, you're not um, working from a place of your own strength, which is understanding that female ha women have all the complexities of men. Write that female character as though she's a man and then just put a skirt on her because it's an action movie. And in fact, we shouldn't deny the fact that, the, that we're women and you have to use the qualities we, uh, we, we either innately have or have, you know, via culture and nurture. But, but in this case, she really needed to stop uh, marginalizing the woman in her own script and she she had never been told this before and I'm certain that um, one of the problems with getting this reasonably well-written action script done is that no actress would really be drawn to the role because it lacked complexity uh, the, the the central character had no journey to go on there was no darkness in her soul um, essentially everything that uh, Helen just said, I was nodding <laughs> so vigorously because I, I completely, completely agree. Um, I, I think that, um, I think that we have to stop caring about, um, making things that are like something that has gone before and start trying to do things in a fresh way. Um, I know now it's almost inconceivable even to me that Buffy the Vampire Slayer at one point didn't exist, but when she did pop up on our radar because we read Joss Whedon's incredibly innovative script about a cheerleader who discovered she had superpowers, and this was before comedy and horror coexisted on the screen as comfortably as they do now, um, everybody was so refreshed. And I mean the male executives at 20th Century Fox, as well as the female executives. And the, the ticket to getting that movie made was really that it was able to be made at a price. And by the way, it was a female director um, who was also the producer who also put her own $10,000 on the line to lock down that script and secure financing for the movie. That's the reason that movie made, because she understood that in every girl, there's, um, there's somebody who wants to be both pretty and powerful, and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I think that that complexity that Helen was talking about is absolutely vital. And when we see it, we're so, we're so braced by it. We're so um, invigorated by it. And when I say we, I'm, I'm going to speak, I'm going to take the liberty of speaking for men as well as women. It's fun to see women as they really are in all their darkness, in all their strangeness. I'm thinking of bridesmaids and laughing right now. Um, in all their grossness, um, girls, um, in all their camaraderie. I, I don't know a single guy, gay or straight, who doesn't wonder what women talk about when they're alone, sex in the city and girls and uh, movies about the comp, uh, I don't know if you have this in Australia, but um, 
A Big Love, which was about a polygamist family, which is really about the friendship between all the women in the family. Um, it answers that question, what women talk about when they're alone and um, the, 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 the strength of that uh, female bond and friendship. Um, those are themes that are hugely important. Anyway, I do go on. So, so I just want to take you, when, when, we do have a, um, when we do have a character that is powerful in that way and the way that Helen was talking about that does have agency and ambition and determination, as I said, I've often seen people get anxious and they seem, there seems to be less of a tolerance for those characteristics in, in some people, in female characters. And so there's this anxiety to take some of those down a notch because of this concern about likability. And you and I had a great conversation and you said that if that happens, there are compensatory characteristics that you can add into the character to address that if you're having that kind of feedback from financiers or the marketplace or other parties involved. If you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Um, well... I mean, when, when Hillary Clinton was the first lady, um, all of America, well, most, much of America was very uncomfortable with how assertive she was and how determined she wasn't to stay home and bake cookies. It's always uncomfortable to kind of shake up a, um, the status quo. Um, but um, I'm not... I, Megan, I'm not sure I remember uh, what I was thinking when I talked about those compensatory um, uh, qualities, but... Um, I, I'll prompt you, Susan. So you said that um, okay. you could build in, uh, look at um, how is the character viewed within the story by other characters? Do they have respect? Do they have professional ability? Do they have intelligence? Do they have a sense of humour? These are all the things that can... Then, If you have these things, you can then take other characteristics much yes. more extreme. Yes, because um, because we're much quicker to hate women than we are men if they are ruthless. Um, but actually, that paradigm has been broken. If their ruthlessness is for the greater good, you know, we may very well accept it. Um, humor goes a long way to creating likability. I mean, just in a practical in a practical sense, if you're selling something, if you're if you're not making a movie as an independent film where you get to call the shots um, and basically cast a great actor and get the money and go make it, and you have to answer to a big Hollywood studio, and there are um, you know there's there are concerns about the likability of the character. I always think that humor, that goes, which goes hand in hand with intelligence, is a wonderful way to um, create warmth in a character, whether that character is male or female. But it particularly works well, I think, with women, and um, and also vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I so agree with what Helen had to say about male vul vulnerability as well. I think that. Um, the fragility of men and the relationships between men is such a neglected area in um, in film, and uh, I, I think, but, but I do think that that vulnerability is a really wonderful tool to use, um, even if that vulnerability comes when that person's alone. I'm I'm thinking of. Um, there's a moment in broadcast news, which was one of the first movies I ever worked on. I'm dating myself as a junior creative exec. When Holly Hunter, who's been strong, she's she's playing a producer, so of course I loved it. Um, but she's she's incredibly strong. She's bossing a cab driver around. She's telling everybody what to do. And then when she's alone for a second, she gives herself like 30 seconds to burst into hysterical tears, pulls herself together, and goes back out again. And I thought that was kind of fabulous. Um, and uh, I think it was kind of fabulous because it embraced the idea that women do cry. Um, you know, things don't fall completely apart if somebody sheds a tear. It's not the end of the, it's not the, end of the world if somebody cries. Uh, you can actually recover from that and go on to be a human being and li live a full and productive <laughs> life. Um, <laughs> But, uh, um, and, I, 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 lo I love that moment, and I think those are the kinds of things that, that really do help, and that, and that speak to the financiers, or perhaps people who are less sympathetic to the idea of breaking out of the stereotypes. Yeah, and that it's about engageability rather than likability. Now, one of the things that you and I have often talked about, and I know is the subject you're passionate about, 
is Hollywood's apparent market amnesia re-films for female audiences. So please talk to us a little bit about mm. that. Well, it drives me crazy. Um, you know, movies that speak directly to the female audience do huge business and um, they, even before their movies and as books, they'll do huge business. And I mean, we've seen it recently in movies like Twilight, The Hunger Games, um, uh, The Help. Um, I, I think Helen mentioned Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. I mean, it goes on and on. We only make about 16% of movies specifically for the female audience. It's a, an audience that is really hungry for movies. And, you know, the, the, be, the worst kept secret is that men come along with women to those movies and men are, especially mature men, by mature I mean over the age of 30, are starved for those character-driven movies too. Um, and you know the the success of movies like Harry Potter. I had a I had a debate with the head of distribution at a major Hollywood studio. He, he actually he's the head of international acquisitions at the studio, but he funds a lot of movies that are female driven. And he said, you know, I was thinking Harry Potter. I was talking to somebody the other day about how Harry Potter wouldn't have been so successful if it had been Harriet Potter. And I said, you're thinking about the female audience entirely in the wrong way. The fact is that the female audience came to see that movie and supported it and is the reason that it's the mammoth success that it is. And it's because they didn't come to see Hermione. They came because they are Harry Potter. And that's why Brookback Mountain succeeded too. It didn't come, um, it, it didn't become successful on the strength of the gay audience, which is a relatively small part of the population, but was it very supportive of the film. It was hugely financially successful because the studio that released it, Focus, was smart enough to go after the female audience, knowing that the female audience is kind of um, gender ambidextrous. We, we for so long have had to identify with um, other people, or maybe we're just naturally empathic, that we go to see movies about other segments of the population and we put ourselves in their shoes. And in Brokeback Mountain, many of us saw a story of unrequited love that we identified with very strongly. So we're, we're an incredibly powerful audience. And I, I think I've mentioned to you too, Megan, we, we see movies cross-generationally. There are themes, as Helen mentioned, like female friendship, um, uh, like um, discovering a mystery about your your birth, the Princess Diaries, um, that, that women go to see cross-generationally. Gener gener in the Princess Diaries, which, you know, it's it's not um, fine, a fine film. It, it's, it's, you know, popular filmmaking, the Disney film. But when Disney made that film, they thought they were making it for five-year-olds and for grandmas. And what they discovered is and this is a little embarrassing, but everybody in between, came, every woman in between those ages came to the movies. Either they were bringing kids or they were secretly just going on their own in groups because there's this princess fantasy that is, uh, you know, um, in us. But that's not the only fantasy and that's not the only theme. I'm sure everybody in this room knows somebody who we're also repeat viewers. That's the other thing that distributors and marketers know about women. We, we will re repeatedly see movies that we like, um, almost medicinally. Um, for example, all of the um, contemporary adaptations of Jane Austen and the period Jane Austen movies that talk about heartbreak and hopefulness about love, those, I mean, I don't know about anybody in the room that I'm talking to, but I know at least 10 women who have seen all of those movies multiple times and they're their go-to movies on a sad Friday night. Um, so we're an incredibly powerful audience and those themes really do speak to us. Now, Susan, you said something interesting. You talked about that we can, female viewers can locate themselves in the male protagonist and I think we'll talk about that more amongst the panel during the session. Um, but, um, but I know, you know, certainly with, with the female members of my staff, we are often reading material which is uh, male-focused outside ex our experience and we stretch to locate ourselves. 
Um, if it's about an area that I have no experience, I'll often talk to a male member of the staff or get them to read it. So trying to make sure that I'm understanding where the material is coming from. And I know that you have said that in the States that even though there are great successes every year from films which are very directly skewed at the female audience, it's a huge success. And then the next time someone takes in to see a movie, it's like, oh, I don't think it'll work. And then when it works, everyone goes, wow, who knew? What a surprise. So what's going on with the male executives? Do you think when they are looking at a project that is aimed at a female audience and not at them, they're not as used to sort of having to stretch a little bit and they think that they feel that it doesn't work for them and therefore they make the assumption that it doesn't work? Is that what you think is going on? I think it's a couple of things. I think it's that. Um, I think that um, they're not getting the visceral hit off the script that a woman reading the script might get because she might understand the theme. And I think that they need to have the experience, the, the, um, some, some of the executives, there are some of course who are very, who either listen to their female executives or they themselves have a really strong um, intuition and a skill for identifying material for the female audience. But I, I think, um, I think they, they sometimes just don't get it in its early form. I had an experience with one of the movies that I made. I won't mention any names or titles, no reservations. Um, and, uh, I, oh, uh, did I do that? Anyway, I was, in, um, I was in Australia making Aquamarine, a film about female friendship at the tween level, while um, No Reservations was being shot in the United States by an Australian director. Um, Scott Hicks, but I went to the first, I hope he's not in the audience, but I went to the first um, screening, market research screening of the movie. And I'd just come back from Australia and I was really excited to see the film. And I knew that the studio had comprised pretty much all of male executives, except for a female music executive. They'd all seen the movie about five or six days before. And um, I was sitting next to one of them um, and he's an old friend and they'd recruited an audience of mostly women and I knew it was going to be great. I'd helped develop the script. The cast was perfect for the role. The story was incredibly, uh, I, I just knew it was going to be great. Uh, and Scott Hicks is great. So we're sitting there and from moment one, the audience loved it. I mean, they're, they're audibly reacting to it. It was, uh, it's, it was one of those dreamy producer moments when the movie's actually working in the very first screening. And I look over at my old friend and he's blackberrying for dear life. You know? And I look at the blackberry and it, it, he's blackberrying the chairman of the studio saying, oh my God, they actually like it. <laughs> And I looked at him and I like, I like hit him on the shoulder. And, what are you talking about? Of course they like it. You saw it a week ago. You knew. And he goes, no, I didn't know. And I, that was like, a, Oprah would have called it an aha moment. It, it was like, really? You couldn't tell by watching it? No, they actually needed the audience in the room to be able to feel the, um, to be able to feel what that this movie would have such a big effect on on the female audience, and um, look, I know when you're an executive, you sometimes get detached from your emotions because you're moving a million miles an hour. But when you're in a movie theater, I, I, I don't know. It, it just seemed like something that was so obvious to me, and I realized there's a huge disconnect between what material is going to work for this audience and the people who are ultimately making the decision. And I think a lot of the material um, gets dumbed down before a yes is given. And, and then complexity, you know, people, the artists who are making the movie try to inject complexity back in, but it can turn into a Frankenstein, you know, when that happens. Fortunately, in, this, in the case of this film, it was very much protected. Um, and the ultimate film did very well at the box office and um, audiences really enjoyed it. And um, it had some darkness in it, which I think is part of what scare, you know, a comedy that has death in it is not a, it, it's a frightening thing. Um, I, I mean, I think that a lot of what um, Helen was saying about sort of embracing 
the darkness and complexity of female themes and characters is incredibly important and incredibly scary um, for studios to do. But the payoff in the long run is really great. I mean, look, Pretty Woman was about a hooker, you know, and it's become the biggest fairy tale of all time. If we're talking about, you know, you know, mainstream Hollywood That's films, but. Susan, we'll, um, we're going to come back to you shortly, but just before we leave you, I just wanted to ask you, I know you've got a lot of positive ideas, so can you give us a couple of thoughts about what you believe that women, that we can do ourselves to increase our chances of getting our projects made? Well, um, as producers and directors, I think we have to, uh, this may seem obvious, but we have to support each other. We have to talk each other up because women much more than men are penalized for self-promoting. Um, it's a sad fact of life and we really have to, and men have been very, we need to take a page for men who have been um, very good at creating camaraderie and giving a hand up um, to, to help others. And it's something that I make a huge priority in my life. I probably spend a third to a half of my time mentoring and, um, and supporting um, other women. And we need to hire women when we're in a position of power and not be shy about it or apologetic about it. Just do it because um, it's better, it's good for the movie. I mean, obviously have your reasons for do it if, doing it if somebody um, confronts you about it. Recently at the DGA summit, um, the, somebody who was a minority said he always supports women. He thinks of all the unique reasons why this woman is right for a job so that he can make the argument as much as possible. I mean, know the, the statistics about gen gender diversity and other diversity. They lead to success. They, um, they bring success. Um, I think that if you're in a position to finance, um, finance women. Um, don't be afraid of female, um, female uh, themed material, uh, material that has huge roles. Um, know that there's an, a very hungry audience out there. And I, I really believe in engaging and enlisting men. I think that you know, most of the men that, that I meet at, when I do fundraising, when I pitch, love women. They um, are oblivious to ways in which um, they may contribute to um, women's stories not being told with complexity, but they really want to see women succeed. They have daughters and wives and sisters and mothers who they know are starved for great um, storytelling, and they themselves want to see complex and interesting stories about women. So I, I think we have to, um, I think we have to talk to men and enlist men and make it their problem because most of the men I know are in support of diversity and this is a diversity and human rights issue, well, you that, know? So I say, bring the guys into the conversation. Well,